let's be clear on this. Just because you pay a lot for something, it doesn't mean you're getting a better deal in terms of their trustworthiness around right. labour issues. You're listening to Climate Curious, a podcast for people who care about the world but find the current conversation about climate change confusing, boring or scary. Hello, Ben. Hello. Can you believe this is episode eight? This, do you know what? This This is actually... I was thinking about this just before we started, and um, this is wild to me, because I knew nothing about any of these topics before we started. Literally zero. And now and now you're like a committed I'm curious an expert. climate you're an do you know expert. what i mean i am i am a global climate change pioneer i feel like i've made it to the heights the peak of the mountain i definitely think you've leveled up i definitely think you've leveled <laughs> oh, that up that was a and... nice way of saying no you haven't <laughs> <laughs> um and i'm i'm actually really excited because we're going to do a bonus episode mm-hmm. after this one where you and i get to actually reflect on on some of that journey so oh so um, good we'll come back to that I am super excited that this is our, our you know, our, our final episode of season one yeah. because it brings together, well, it kind of brings, it's like all in the family. So our speaker um, this week also spoke at TEDx London Women the same year you spoke at TEDx I know. London Women. It was so cool. <laughs> I'm such a geek. I'm like, oh, wow. Well, so when we were thinking about this, the curation of this podcast, we, mm. we knew we wanted to talk a bit about fashion. But to be honest, I'm a bit tired of the normal conversation mm-hmm. around that. So when we were thinking about who could possibly, you know, talk about fashion <laughs> and sustainability in a way that isn't a bit, I don't know, I'm not going to use the B word, but let's say me. Say me. Boring, yeah, boring. B an, word is boring. No, another, word, another, another B word. Um, boring, the boring word. Say me. So let me, before I like, before I give it all away and, and, make you know any other terrible jokes let me for those who don't know introduce our speaker and then we'll get started how's that sound ben this yeah this is a this is a big introduction isn't it, it go is, on it all, the, all ha- the best mate and i have to tell you that i actually cut out like to a whole section of this person's life just because i there's no time <laughs> just so, a whole part a segment of their existence yeah no problem. so okay so our, our guest uh this week is baroness lola young Whee! she's the i know hello she's she, hi, Lola. Let me tell everyone a bit about you. So you're a former actor. You're a professor of cultural studies. Mm-hmm. You were the head of culture at the Greater London Authority. You sat on a number of boards of cultural organisations here in the UK, like the National Theatre and the South Bank Centre. You've done a lot of ju- judging and chairing of prizes that I cannot even, like, list. Um, and then kind of I feel like there's another side to your work, which is making a major contribution on creating legislation to eliminate modern slavery. And so you chair two all-party parliamentary groups, one on ethics and sustainability in fashion, mm-hmm. and one on sport, modern slavery and human rights. Um, so this, this I, I have to say, I already kind of knew this about you, awesome. Um, and then I went and I looked up what you'd done since your TEDx talk, which was in December of 2018. Ben, do you want to, do you want to hear this insane list? Yeah, go on, tell okay. me. So you're this now... is already, sorry, this is like a dodecahedron of career. Like you were like an, another side, but there's like yeah. 15 sides already. <laughs> go for it, go. So you're, Lola's now a non-executive director at Bloomberg Publishing Company. Obviously. She was elected as an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. She's a co-chair for the Foundation for Future London, and she is the Chancellor of the University of Nottingham. How, what, the Chancellor of the University of Nottingham. <laughs> that is, this is mad. Okay. So we're so excited to have you. I think, I think a, actually a, a round of applause for this one. Maybe. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're very kind. I want to dive right in and ask you, how does modern slavery link with climate change? What do they have to do with one another? It's an interesting question. And um, one that I, I'll, 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 I'll talk about the principal sort of link, if I may, because I do think it's interesting. But before I say that, if I can say, I think it's really important on everything to try and join up the dots. So into that kind of nexus, if you like, of modern slavery and environmental sustainability, I would also put inequality, which would also include racism and poverty. So. Th- all of these things are interconnected. But in, 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 
if I can give a sort of s simple, slightly made up, but very plausible um, example, let's say, you know, you're in a village somewhere in, in one of the developing countries and um, uh, there's been a um, huge sort of agricultural takeover of the land for, um, for producing some lovely vegetables so that we can have smashed avocado on toast in Hoxton every morning. Right. In order to do that, the uh, forest has been taken down and taken away because you need the land. So next time it rains really heavily as a result of that whole global warming phenomenon, plus the erosion of the land. So it takes everything away. The village is kind of wiped out. So then the people in that village, what are they going to do? How are they going to survive? Where's their income going to come from? And that's the moment where these opportunistic criminal gangs associated with trafficking and modern slavery, well, we can help you to get to the West. We can help you to get to Europe where you'll get a great job and you'll have loads of money and you can send it back for your uh, families. If you can't all go, we'll take the young people. Just give us any money you've got saved, you know, give that to us so that we can pay for passage and accommodation and everything. And then gone, you know, or even as people are trekking along the roads, having been displaced from their communities due to some disaster or due to uh, mining or due mm. to poisoning of the land, that's when they're at their most prone, their most vulnerable for people to pick them off and um, uh, put them into these really desperate situations. There's all kinds of detail and other things that go on, but that is a kind of um, a summary of what can happen. So, so trafficking is, am I using the right word here? So basically, let me just give you the, the the preface, right? Which is that I always, every time we do one of these episodes, I know absolutely nothing. So I'm going to ask you all of the questions that everybody listening who knows nothing is probably thinking um, and wanting to ask, but won't get the opportunity to ask. So when I say trafficking, am I using the right word there? Well, well, again, that's a good question, Ben, because um, uh, when... I talk about modern forms of slavery. Mm -hmm. I'm usually including people trafficking, mm -hmm. exploitative and abusive labor systems. Right. Something called debt bondage and child labor. So debt bondage mm -hmm. is when um, I say to you, I've got a job for you, but you've got to pay me £5,000 to get you into that job. Right. And then I'll, I'll be taken, and there's interest charge on that, by the way. Yeah. So for everything you earn, I will take that. And if you don't pay me off, your family will inherit that debt and I'll be coming to them after you've right. died or gone away or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's like you know, that, that is passed down over generations, it can be. That's like in the beginning of um, Baby Driver. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that film, but there's a, it is, yeah, it's like the, like the same way that he works for that guy, right? Okay, I understand. So, so, so these things are centuries old, these kinds of practices. Wow. And yeah, so, so, so modern day slavery can include all of those things, including trafficking. Mm -hmm. I think the problem with the word trafficking is that a lot of people associate that with sex trafficking. Right, right, right. So, so there is that, and that would be included, you know, under modern slavery legislation. But it's not only about that. People are trafficked in order to work in factories or down mines or children to get the cobalt that enables us to use our smartphones and what mm -hmm. have you. You know, that, that the people can be trafficked in a variety of ways. If I trace that backwards now, what you're saying is that one of the, one of the key causes for that is natural disasters caused by climate change, which is displacing people from their original communities. It can be a cause, yeah. Right. So, so you know, you, you wanted that sort of link between environmental yeah. uh, problems. I mean, if, if you think about it, like um, there's a place, there used to be this place, I can't remember where it was, hopeless for remembering these things, but, you know, where the river runs red because red is the in colour for, for clothes that year, right? Next mm. year it will run blue because blue is the in colour. And like, so, so where's your no drinking way. water coming from? You've got to move away from that. As soon as you're on the move, you're vulnerable. Because yeah. the, the current statistics, I know I don't want to go into loads of statistics and, and they can be manipulated, mm -hmm. but, you know, the current estimates are that there's some 40 million people in one form of modern slavery or another across the world at any one time Gosh. at the moment 
40 million. So that includes all those things that you, you, you were saying about trafficking and so on. And Lilla, is that more or l- like when we think about slavery, I think a lot of people just think well, that thing in the past, that thing that happened, you know, a long time ago, you know, is that 40 million people who are in some form of modern slavery, you know, more or less than what we would think about in the past is that easy to say is that something that you can tell well me? I, I, yeah it, it, it's something that i would i would not answer because i would say that's the wrong question mm-hmm. sorry but you know <laughs> because because it's like then you're into you know which which was worse kind right. of thing it's like saying you know which was worse holocaust or modern slavery or african slavery you know the the th- thing is all those things are totally abhorrent mm-hmm. and we shouldn't tolerate them but so i think I think the, the the good point from what you've said, Marianne, is that we thought we'd stopped all of that, right. or we thought at least we'd kind of eliminated most of it. And in fact, although although some of those forty million will not be in um, enslaved positions in the way that we think of it, like as being in chains or whatever, but again, you know, to look at something. Do you remember some years ago in 2013, there was a a, a building collapsed in Bangladesh and it was a huge scandal and tragedy, obviously, because um, a lot of the clothes that come onto the high street were being made in that factory. Now, you know, they weren't typically enslaved. They weren't in chains as they were making those clothes, those mainly Mm. women. But the working conditions under which they worked would, would, would be things like, for example, you can't go to the toilet without asking permission. You don't get a proper break. You're paid below the minimum wage. You might be locked into the building to stop you from leaving and, and to make sure you work hard. The um, infrastructure of the building would be an unsafe set of working conditions. All of these different things would mean that that is abusive or exploitative labor. Mm-hmm. And so it would come under this term, modern day slavery. And for me, like, I always think w- when I hear the term modern day slavery, like that, that to me is something that feels so almost the same as climate change, like so overwhelming that I have no idea where to start to tackle that issue. And and it, and it just sounds scary. And like, almost like if I begin to think about it, I'm going to automatically become complicit in it because the moment that you lose like the unawareness or the moment that you're not oblivious anymore, it becomes your issue. Right. So like, I'm super interested to, to delve into like um, what, what you do in this area. But before we get to that, like, how did you even get here? How, how did this become like a conversation that you thought was important or something that you were like, Oh, I need to, do something about this because this seems like you you used to be um an actress right and you were weren't you doing like bbc and and like children's programs so how do how do you go from how do you go from little vicky to to this like modern day slavery and and dismantling that yeah well you know I, i i to me, it's like it is part of this. You you talked about it, tracing the dots, joining mm-hmm. the dots. So, you know, from when I was quite young, I was aware of injustice, to put it in, you know, sort of inverted commas. I was aware that mm-hmm. things weren't right. You know, I could see black people being beaten up by the police in South Africa, and I knew that wasn't right. right. And then so when I became an actress, I joined, well, you had to join Equity, the union, and I became involved, which... In, in, in something called the Afro-Asians Committee, which I then went on to chair, which mm. was like, how can we get more black representation? I can tell you, that's a whole other podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. Because the kinds of discussions and arguments we used to have with television producers and directors then, you would not believe them. That's where I kind of honed my skills in terms of being on committees and boards and things, is because you were faced with a group of people who were kind of saying, no, we can't, we can't have a, a black person playing a, a bank manager. That would be ridiculous. Right. Yeah, literally, <laughs> literally. So all of that. So then, so, you know, having gone through that kind of baptism of, 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 of fire, as it were, you know, I did a lot of public service as um, Marion very kindly drew attention to all of those boards and mm-hmm. did stuff around black history and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And as I was in, <laughs> in the House of Lords, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, what's going to be my niche here? But before I'd even begun to think about that, it was just one of those moments where 
I happened to be in the office. I happened to pick up the phone and somebody said, can you put an amendment down? This is when Labour were in government. Right. Now, think back many <laughs> way, years way, ago. Way, 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 way. Many back. years ago. <laughs> in Tony Blair's government. So put down an amendment to a new law that was going through which was actually about coroners and the criminal justice system. And I was asked by Anti-Slavery International to put down, as we call it, table an amendment which would criminalise domestic servitude and forced labour in Britain. Now, at the Wasn't time... Wasn't criminalised people... already, sorry. Exactly, exactly. Oh, my gosh. This was 2009. This is 2009. I promise you, that was everybody's reaction including no my way. fellow peers everyone's going why are you having to do this surely and that there's a long sort of historical tale as to how that happened and again right. that's, a, that's yet another podcast <laughs> well, but, but for, any, part four. <laughs> yeah, for part 400 yeah. um but yeah so so i put down this amendment which criminalized and would you believe that that labor government resisted and resisted until literally the 11th hour and, then, and I said, look, well, look, we'll have a vote on it then. And this would look really bad for Labour to, yeah. to resist this. It's because at the time, people weren't using modern slavery as it wasn't part of people's vocabulary. Right. This was this was all kind of new. And people thought, oh, well, you can if somebody's, you know, in trouble. So I actually met somebody, a woman. Um, I think she was from Uganda mm -hmm. who'd come to this country legitimately to work for a couple who were very well off as a, as a housekeeper. Throughout her tenure there, she was physically abused. She was um, um, emotionally abused. She was working 18 hours a day with half a day off a week. She was paid a certain amount, but then they would deduct three quarters of it so that she could sleep on the floor in a garage. That was her oh, accommodation. Oh and this is going on, this is going on in London. So all of that was going on and you can bet, you know, that there's an organization called Kalyan, and this was the norm for the kinds of cases that they were pursuing. And, and there was no right. law under which you could get those people. Oh, and the other thing is, of course, they take away your passport, took away her passport right. and told her if she left the house, she'd be arrested. Now, when you come from a state where that can really happen. Yeah, it does you know, happen. Without your ID. Exactly. So then, yeah. uh, so she, she was too afraid to go out until one day she just had enough. She got hit round the head. And she ran out of the house and oh. somebody down the road knew of this organization and, and I took her. Look, there are any number of stories I could tell you around this kind of subject area. Yeah, no, Chi, I we've set the foundation around yeah. modern slavery, right? And how that might link to climate change. You know, I mentioned at the beginning, oh, we've had these conversations about sustainability and fashion, but actually they're not that widespread. So let's set the foundation around climate change and fashion and then link it all up together. So from your perspective, like what are the fundamental things that people need to know when it comes to, to fashion, the fashion industry and climate change? Right. Um, you know, there, there, there's a there's a simplistic way of putting this, and I, and I mean simplistic rather than simple which I don't like because it becomes very kind of, you know, if you do this, this will work. And if you don't do it, we'll all die. And it, it is not, it's not like that. As with everything else, it's really complex. So one of the things that you'll hear people talk about in relation to fashion and sustainability is fast fashion is the devil and, you know, must be eliminated at all costs. And um, so, and everybody's got to save up for something that costs a lot more and keep it for longer. Right. Actually, the really important bit is keeping it for longer. Is you know, so so the whole thing about fast fashion, which emerged, it wasn't always like this. I think if you're young, it's it's easy to think that things were always the way they are now. If you can get your head around, there was an era when people didn't have mobile phones, and in that no. same era. <laughs> <laughs> no, try, try again. <laughs> Imagination, think, think, think. Look, watch a hist historical drama. No, I remember. Um, I remember being phone. little. When you remember. So, but in in that also in that period, you know, or or a bit further back, maybe there wasn't fast fashion. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there were there were maybe two fashion stores on in a, in a mile radius or something. Right. So that whole thing about fast fashion, about making it cheaply, stacking it up and selling it really quickly so you then move on to the next thing, which means that we've got to keep consuming in order to keep that business going. That's what mm -hmm. it's based on. 
So if you if you keep what you you buy, you kind of undermine that business model. So if you can keep some of the stuff is so cheap and nasty that it won't last. We know this. Right. But but on the other hand, if you can find things, one of my sort of favorite people, Ursula de Castro, who works in this field, she says, I've still got my Primark T-shirt from 10, 15 years ago. Well, in fashion terms, that, it's a bit like dog years, isn't it? So, you know, it's like one year. <laughs> That's dead. Seven. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> yeah. No, but you keep it. You keep yeah. it because it's still wearable. Because if you don't, what happens is it most likely will end up in landfill. So is so my, my question around this, right, is that the landfill thing, because this is a this is a narrative that I hear all the time. Is this is that because clothes don't are they not biodegradable or they like it, you can't dispose of them, you can't get rid of them? That's right. So if you think about and again, you know, going back to, you know, what Marion was saying earlier when I said to her, look, you know, it's complicated. Now, I've got friends who aren't in this business who will say to me, it's better to buy cotton mm -hmm. because if you buy cotton, cotton is biodegradable. Mm -hmm. And you think, yeah, on that level, it's fine, but it takes up masses of water. Unless it's organically certified, it takes up masses of pesticides. It's uh, very often people, this is one of the key areas, and I read about it today um, in, in the news, where you get people in forced labour conditions imposed by the state to pick cotton. So cotton isn't kind of totally innocent and blameless. But then on the other hand, you've got the, the polys, the polyester and, and so on, mm -hmm. which are derived from oil. And we all know that oil is a bad thing. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, something that's made from uh, uh, polyester is easier to recycle, to upcycle. So I've got okay. a couple, I've got a coat that's made from recycled plastic bottles and old polyester um, clothing, but you, I mean, you wouldn't, there's no way you'd know that from looking at it. It's very stylish and actually quite, you know. <laughs> don't, don't right, I say those, it those two things are not mutually like oppositional, <laughs> right? Like, no, not, absolutely. Okay. So, so this is why the whole thing around fashion and sustainability is complicated. Okay. Um, um, and um, I mean, so, so, so some people would talk about um, the loop, that if you get um, a loop whereby nothing is ever thrown away, it just becomes something else, mm -hmm. you know, that's very good. Um, but then again, if you've got, um, let's say, um, a, leather, a pair of leather shoes, something I always remember, if you, if, if, and people are, t with the thing about shoes is it's very hard to pass them on, right, to other yeah. people because they usually look crap or they don't <laughs> yeah. fit. The and if, if they're leather, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, leather shoe, one pair of leather shoes takes 40 years to biodegrade. Mariam, Mariam, if you could see Mariam's face right now. <laughs> okay, so one pair of leather shoes takes 40 years. I mean, it's just one of those things where you feel like, no matter what you do, you're just so screwed. This yeah. is one of the things with fashion for me, is like you said, you buy cotton, it's coming from forced labour camps, or it's killing lakes. You buy polyester but you know if you put it in a landfill it's going to pollute microplastics are going to come out of it you know if you buy leather well that's like an animal if you you know if you buy pla and so you're just I, yeah so for me and it, it feels it feels like the system is set up so you can just never win well and i mean I, okay so i'll relate that comment back to something ben said earlier because when when he was talking about modern slavery he said it all sounds so big and overwhelming that you don't mm -hmm. know what you can do the the, the thing is to to do the small thing because mm -hmm. if everybody does something small then it becomes something big but if nobody does anything then nothing happens, nothing yeah. changes. And I think, you know, it, it, it's really hard to get, listen, I find it hard to get my head around. And when we come on to the confessional bit, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, that'll be something else. But, you know, there, it, 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 we where we have control, let's try and use it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not one of those people who believes in what I think of as eco-shaming, which is like, blaming people who don't have very much money for buying cheap clothes. That's not on as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the less disposable income you have, the less able you are 
potentially to make a difference in this sector is where it's it's corporations it's businesses that have got to do the right thing right because it's in their hands and if they're not doing the right thing government has to um encourage them incentivize them and if they still don't do the right thing then they have to be penalized right and that that, that to me is the long and short of it consumers we can do as much as we can do those of us who are, do have a bit of disposable income can choose where we shop and we can fork out for a biodegradable gradable jacket or whatever mm -hmm. but a vegetable tanned leather you know Thank which you. <laughs> is vegetable tanned organically um reared uh, leather yeah is probably not as bad as um polyurethane derived from oil etc cetera, etc cetera. so right. again it, the complexity but then again you see i don't expect i don't expect you to go into a shop and you think oh well i've got you know 20 quid to spend on something nice for myself now let me have a look at the provenance of this and see <laughs> what it says on here oh wait a minute though but there's three points for this and six points for that and you know which one is the best one and right. you know you'd be there all day and you'd have to do a phd in order to have that information <laughs> so at the end of the day we have to rely we have to be able to trust the businesses to do the right thing. Right. And to me, that is the crux of it. Same with environment. What's the point? Not what's the point. I, I switch off my lights. I'm very good at switching off my lights and low energy bulbs and all the rest of it. I'm doing that. And then there's some blooming great office block down the road that's got its lights on all through the night. Right. You know, how does that make sense? Yeah. So I think for people like me who are in a position whereby we can say to uh, government, you've got to get on these people and you've got to um, stop um, pandering to your business interests who are kind of, right. you know, trying to uh, persuade you to, 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 to have a light touch on regulation. Mm. And you've got to say to them, switch off your lights or do this or, or do that. And if you don't, then we will penalise you. That, to me, is the way that you, you make that change. Mm -hmm. The thing where people can come in is to say, yeah, government, we back you on this. This is what we want you to do because mm -hmm. we can't do it all ourselves. I actually, I think it was yesterday, I Googled um, like su sustainable uh, streetwear brands or something like that. And it was a it was a pretty dire situation, man. There's not there's not very many at all. There's not, like, it feels like there's not very many options in terms of what you can do that is the, what f that feels like the right thing to do. I guess what, what we can or as you've said we, what we are doing what we can do as individuals is make small decisions um it, it also feels like um this conversation is a conversation that's quite um veiled in privilege in a lot of ways right like there are certain people who can access this conversation and there are certain people who cannot access this conversation um and and for like you'd mentioned before for those of us who who maybe um are able to go out and say oh here's 20 pounds i'm gonna spend it on something nice for myself but then there are so many people in situations who can't afford to do that and have to for example buy fast fashion um, um i think one of my one of the things that made me reluctant about this conversation the fashion conversation in particular was that i just felt bad like more so than other conversations i think i felt bad all the time um but this is this is like almost like a weight off my shoulders because i don't i don't necessarily feel like i am the evil person in the situation um but then i guess there's a flip side of that which is that also the decisions that i make as an individual do have an impact right impact. yeah so i wouldn't want to um uh i'm no fan of disempowering people mm -hmm. by default which is say well nobody none of us has any responsibility i mm -hmm. don't think that at all but i think it it it, it depends on where you are look if you're dependent on food bank and, and when we talk about fast fashion, it's interesting because everybody thinks, oh, well, it's frivolous. It's the thing that girls do and some boys and blah, 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 blah. You don't have That's to have that. It is, if you've got two or three kids and you've got to buy T-shirts for them for gym, right. you've got to buy a skirt for them for or a pair of trousers for school, it's still it's the garment industry. It's not yeah. just about fashion. So, so what are you going to do then? Are you going to say, well, I've had to go to the food bank this week, but I've got to buy the, the kids' um, school uniform from John Lewis, you know? <laughs> 
if, if, no. if I want if I want if I want a trustworthy brand. Yeah. You know, we're not this is this is mad. It's it's cloud cuckoo land. Yeah. And I think one of the things for me that I've come across with other fashion activists is this kind of attitude that says, well, it's up to the consumer to 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 drive all of this. And I'd say no, not really. I don't think so. I think the fashion industry has created the business model mm-hmm. that, that 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 has given us fast fashion. Mm-hmm. And also, I want to be cl- let's be clear on this: just because you pay a lot for something, it doesn't mean you're getting a better deal in terms of their trustworthiness around right. labour issues. So there are factories that um, somebody once famously uh, came to, I asked him to come to the House of Lords for a meeting about this whole area when I was first learning about it. And he brought with him a little case of T-shirts. Mm-hmm. So the the one T-shirt, uh, the cheapest one cost about two pound and was from a, a famous fast fashion uh, a chain. The next one was about 20 quid. The next one was about 40. And then the top one was 65 pounds Don't say that all, they, were all all, the all, they were all made in the same factory <laughs> no way Every, all made in the same factory maybe a difference between the co- quality of cotton but right. not 63 pounds worth my gosh so so this is what you know a, and what a con this this is this is the trick that's being played on us sometimes yeah. not all the time again you know you've got to be as i say you've got to kind of have a phd in all this stuff or just be <laughs> very vigilant um but yeah, it it so why how as I say how can the consumer understand process research and then budget for all of these variables? No, what what you can do, mm-hmm. particularly you, Mariam, and you, Ben, you you can you can say now that you know these things, as you say, you can't unknow them. So at least you can say um, to your mates or to the people that you work with or whatever. You know, there's a bit of an issue around some of this stuff here. And, mm. and um, whilst we may not be able to change that directly, you know, as, as a single individual person, just think about it. And if you've got the choice, think about what choices you are making and how mm. you can make them. I mean, you know, we, you know, when it comes to um, any of these things, like if, you, if you're talking about racism, for example. Right. I mean, if you, if you, if there was a store that, that sh- sold really um, nice, um, cheap clothing, but you knew that the owners were, um, you know, members of the Ku Klux Klan or the Proud Boys or something, yeah. you'd think twice about shopping there, wouldn't you? Yeah. Because you, we, you, we you, you kind of, you, you wouldn't really want to give them your money if you had the choice. Right. And it, it, it's not dissimilar in, in, in a way, but by the same token, you don't change the system simply by a few consumers boycotting. It has to be a bigger thing than that. And right. sometimes it does get huge. It does. I mean, there was a, a big thing, you know, recently in Leicester with Boohoo. Yeah, fashion yeah, 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 I heard about that. And that is going on and people, you know, that company is in people's sights. They've been implicated in these kinds of practices for, right. for some time. I think one of the things here for me that is so important is is really this is one of those truly intersectional pieces like you know we started talking about modern slavery we've talked about climate change we've talked about fast fashion we've talked about like luxury fashion we you know we're talking about exploitation in places like Bangladesh and then places like London and Leicester you know we're talking about race um, and the system, and it, and yeah, yeah and class. But it's you know always government workers and and class of you know. And so for me, the things that you're learning, like my big one is, and this I think issue highlights it more than almost any other. Is it? It almost doesn't matter what you care about. Climate change is linked to it. Yeah. You you know you care about women's rights. Okay, here we go. If you work up, care about labor rights, if you care about, you know, uh, you know human rights. Mm. trafficking except whatever it might be you know, it's all linked to climate change in some way or climate change is linked to all of it so it kind of for me it's those cross-cutting things that make me feel more like i have a place in this movement mm. 
um, because there are things that I already cared about, like women's rights and labor rights and trafficking. And now I can see how climate change, if we don't solve climate change, we're never going to solve those things. Because that example you said at the beginning is so, like, it's so simple and yet so powerful. Like, if people are forced to put themselves in vulnerable situations because their livelihood is is wiped out due to climate change, then it doesn't matter. Kind of, we're going to continuously make people vulnerable. I just wanted to say for me that that's like the biggest learning mm. for this. Yeah, I think you're so right, Mariam, in terms of that intersectional piece. And it, it, it's interesting because um, I've been talking about this in relation to, to various other things, COVID-19. Um, and also, um, I've been doing a little bit of work for the first time with people with learning disabilities. And that's been a huge learning curve for me mm. and also again an insight because this is also a vulnerable group who get exploited through um, um, uh, forced labor and exploitative labor systems so you know again it's that intersectional piece whereby all of those different systems of um, if I say systems of oppression I think you know what I mean all of those kinds of isms, the, 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 the uh, sexism and racism. If you look at it, if you look at the fashion industry, or if you look at modern slavery, or if you look at climate change, the people who are most affected, well, look around you, who are they? Who's, who, where, in which boroughs do you have um, primary schools on a major traffic roundabout mm. where you've got pollutants from lorries and buses and taxis and cars all day long when yeah. those kids are playing in the playground you know where they're, they're not in Hampstead I don't think yeah the they are in Tottenham <laughs> so you have to think you know um where do they have those big um uh, f those those things when they burn off the oil with the big flares and the flames uh -huh. well you know when we had them in britain out at sea and you know off the coast of, of northeast um uh, britain the ogoni people have got them in their backyards with yeah. shell in the niger delta so so you know as somebody once said you switch on your light here and somebody dies in the niger delta of of, of uh, pollution so it's not mm. quite as simple as that but you know that you get that sort of sense but again we come back to this thing of, of it feeling overwhelming and it, it's easy to feel overwhelmed because when you put those dots together you think oh my god it's too big you yeah. know, the, 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 I can't eliminate racism, sexism, poverty, da, 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 da. And, you know, I do have this argument with people where they say, oh, well, once we've wiped out um, poverty, we can eliminate modern slavery. So you can't wait for that. You know, what do you, you can't wait for that. You, as I say, it's this incremental thing. What is it that you can do um, that, that might seem quite small to you? Might even be just to say, maybe to write a note to your MP, dare I say, and say, um, you know, what's, what's going on with the council? Who are they, who have they outsourced the road sweeping and the uh, uh, rubbish collection to? Mm. And ha has your council checked that um, there's not any forced or exploitative labor in, mm. engaged in that? But as I say, those of us who can should, and if yeah. you can, you know, let, let, let's do it. I think there's there's something really important that you've said you've said there, um, which is those of us who can should. Um, and like, I know that for, for me, again, like these conversations, I'm, I think one of the big learnings, as you reflected earlier, Mariam, like one of the big learnings for me throughout this podcast series has been actually the climate change conversation is like often so wrapped up in in guilt and blame. Um, and a lot of that guilt and blame is like internal, right? A lot of it is like, I blame myself, so I disengage from the conversation. But I think on another level, and like as we've gone on with the conversations, like the more intersectional level seems to be revealing that often a lot of the guilt is, or, or the blame is being directed to people who don't have the capacity to make the changes. Um, so for those of us who are in positions of, of ability to make change, um, 
we probably just need to to do what we can do right and it doesn't mean that we have to change the world um but in terms of systems change also um and in terms of like lobbying government and 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 uh challenging these companies and these businesses on on really high levels to um be more sustainable in their practices there's obviously like massive pieces of work that that we can do in really small bits and like little increments to challenge those people like you say which is really important so i think Lola, we've got one we've got one last question for you before we get to confessions which i know everyone is probably dying to hear i am my last question is so let's say you know everything we are trying to do in in the climate change and the kind of fashion in the sustainability in the modern day slavery world goes well in the next 10 years you know we've talked they, people talk about this decisive decade that we're in can you talk about what your 2030 looks like if everything goes well if everything goes in a positive way as planned well i think there'll be um f- fewer fewer cars yeah. those who can uh walk a lot more i'm an obsessive walker so walk a lot more cycle a lot more use an efficient clean reliable secure and safe public transport system i mean like all oh, this is going to happen in the next 10 years but you know that one would hope towards the end of the 2030s because it, it it is a bit do or die you know the governments have to act as a, and as i say businesses too but i think you know where the optimism is if you like or the positive thing is the technology all the time is 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 and I'm not saying there aren't any downsides to technology because obviously there are but the technology the things you can do now can be brilliant about 5 years ago i came uh, across um somebody had made trainers um that um you planted in the garden and then they they were implanted with seeds so you'd be able to grow something in your garden oh, from your wow. trainers you know and you can make leather wow. in inverted commas from mushrooms now mm. um let alone that the the whole cell thing where you don't you just take a cell from an animal without killing it so there's there's lots of technological potentially solutions so instead of wasting things like you know people who buy three pairs of cheap cheap trousers because they're so cheap it doesn't matter if two of them don't fit they've still got one pair instead mm-hmm. you know you you will have custom made clothing that will be measured by ai and the, you know no wastage so th- there's all of these things that can happen and they need to be fast tracked over the next um decade or so. Hmm. And we need to elect progressive governments. So I guess so your roadmap to 2030 involves investing in great technology, electing progressive governments and being more thoughtful about our consumption. If if we're more thoughtful it, to me it's about being more thoughtful about people, hmm. about other people. So to me the fact that you know those um women uh, who died in that Bangladesh uh, factory collapse just because they're x thousand miles away and weren't the same kind of people as me what does that mean that i'm not supposed to care about them i yeah. can't i can't be like that so if you care about people and you have empathy and you have a little bit of imagination you i know that i wouldn't want you know when my son was 9 i wouldn't have wanted him to be working down a a a mine right of course i wouldn't so why would i think it's all right for somebody else's child to be doing that so that i can have a nice piece of jewelry that's not yeah. on so yeah you can add to the list marian people to have that kind of develop a bit more um uh, yeah to develop their empathy mm-hmm. and um imagination and 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 position themselves in other people's um uh, situations and mm. and their children and think would i put myself or my children through this if i had a choice no yeah and these i th- these ideas of like empathy and imagination and compassion are like recurring themes in in these conversations as well and i think that's a really nice place to wrap up this section before we move into climate confessions climate confessions I don't even know what mine is today. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Okay, Lola, you you've told you you've told us we have to we're going to have to go first. 
I think. I've trailed You're going to have to go first. Yeah, I'm going to have to go first. And, and, you know, okay, but I'm going to preface it with a little thing, <clears throat> which is that <laughs> I, I, all of that I've said is absolutely true, and I totally believe in it, but I recognise how hard it is. Because mm. what we don't and haven't talked about is the psychology of consumerism and how we're positioned by companies and, and uh, commercial enterprises to want more and more and more in the vain hope that it will, will be satisfied. If, if only we have that extra pair of whatever, right. whatever. So my, that, that's what I preface my uh, remarks with. <laughs> that, was, that was such a good, uh, what is it? Tell us what it is. <laughs> I'm begging for your compassion and your empathy. Um, okay, so it's partly, okay, look, I can't stop rationalizing. Okay, I have a thing for shoes. And the, the, my, my rationale is that, I have large feet for a woman, right? right. I have size nine, um, uh, and, and not every size nine fits because I have odd shaped feet as well. So I'm, I'm, I saw, if I can get a pair of shoes on in a shop, I'll buy them because I hope that this will be the pair that are really comfortable, look nice, <laughs> and I'll be able to walk for miles in them. Right. Hence, I've got a, 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 a quite an indulgent collection of shoes. In my defense... I will say that I walk masses and I do wear out shoes and some of these shoes, it's very difficult to repair, but yes, it is. You know, when I say that thing about 40 years to biodegrade, I sort of think, Oh my God, it's me. What I done. <laughs> it's me. It's me. I've done this. Got to find a way of recycling shoes. I think, yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be very happy to hear that you love shoes and know that fact at the same time because I think a lot of people might if they haven't turned us off at that moment already (laughs) (laughs) I've got so many questions but we won't do that now we'll make sure you come back (laughs) Ben what's yours oh mine so mine today I do you know what is is interesting is how hard this becomes like week by week and and how much less attached I feel to it like I, I feel like at this point everybody already knows I'm a bad person so it doesn't even matter what I say. Like, I could say anything and people would be like, oh, yeah, Ben does it every week. But my my climate confession this week, I guess, is about water. So I, when I wash up, when I have a bath um, and when I brush my teeth, I really like warm water, like re- piping hot water, right? Um, so I, I run piping hot water, but when I wash up, I keep the tap running the whole time and I let my tap run the whole time with hot water when I brush my teeth apparently you're not supposed to brush your teeth with hot water I didn't know that but I do that so I let it run with hot water the whole time that I'm brushing my teeth and I often am watching videos on YouTube while I do that so it takes me longer than it should do I mean you Um, are a terrible person so I'm yeah I don't even care anymore it's fine I'm making my changes (laughs) well I wouldn't if I were you no I'm joking (laughs) <laughs> Marion, what what is so, yours so, today? So this week I'm not going to cheat by stealing someone else's climate confession. I've been thinking about it and I think possibly my confession is a big one, which is that I I shop to make myself feel better. Mm. And I and I found that during this pandemic, you know, some of my very close friends said at the beginning they're like, "Oh, you're going to keep this economy going." Like you're gonna single, stop single-handedly, single handedly. <laughs> um, and I and I'm tr- you know and I and I I tried I'm trying very hard to be better at it, so I try to buy you know like I'll like try to direct my shopping to more sustainable brands. Like I've just switched to a, it's a very painful. I'm in the middle of the very painful switch of switching to organic deodorant, which I oh. recommend not being around other people when you have to do that so right now <laughs> as we go into tier three it's a good time um so i'm tr- but i i realized that that it you know it, it's what i'm realizing it doesn't matter even if you keep buying sustainable things you're still buying stuff that's my confession is i i i shop to make myself feel better and that is exactly what all that advertising has convince me to do but look you know um and i'm not going to try and excuse ben's behavior no of course not <laughs> oh but, um, <laughs> that's unexcusable <laughs> no 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 but seriously but i do i do there is the psychology and um as we've been worked on for a long time I'm not saying we've been brainwashed or anything we've been worked on for a long time 
you know, capitalist consumer society, I mean, it cannot exist unless people keep buying stuff, right. the, yeah. the current business model, that's what it is. So that has to be changed. That's what has to change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we have to kind of adapt to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I think my, my confession slash justification is I'm trying to spend my money more thoughtfully. So support brands who do putting things in the world I love, but it doesn't mean I don't have that odd Amazon shop that shows up in a box seven times the size necessary. You know. <laughs> yeah. Every you, day. Every, <laughs> I would have some new candles this week. <laughs> um, well, this has been, this has been a pleasure. What an episode yeah. to end the season on. Yeah, massive. Thank, Lola, thank you so, so much. Also, th- thank you for just being really like approachable and down to earth and and really easy to have a conversation with and you have so much life experience to bring and so and so much knowledge and information you're you've done an amazing job of communicating and it's made it really like easy and accessible for me to have this conversation which i appreciate so much so thank you so much for coming on ben thank you for being an awesome season one co-host and i'm looking forward to reflecting on this season with you yeah well until our episode of reflection make sure that you stay curious (laughs) i'm so good at doing that outro (laughs) thanks for joining us this week if you enjoyed what you listened to today please rate and subscribe and share the episode with a curious friend join the conversation on socials using the hashtag climate curious pod and let us know what you want to hear about next time You can find us online at TEDx London. This podcast was made possible by TEDx London's headline partner, City. City is all about progress and supporting great ideas. And for the past five years, they've supported us to bring world-changing ideas to the TEDx London stage. Now they're taking it to the next level by supporting this new podcast. Thanks, City. This episode was produced by Josie Coulter. Curation and research by Tara Cooper. Engineered and mixed by Ben Beheshti. Artwork designed by Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Lingus. Music composed by Ben the Falcon Beheshti. Presented by Marion Pasha and Ben Hurst. Thank you.